Hi everybody, we are trying again. Let's see. Okay, I'm back. Eileen, I think I see you there. Right. All right, so we will try to get Dr. Burke on here. All right, he's invited. Okay. Ah, there we go. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, Dr. Burke. <laughs> How are you? Good. Yeah, I, I, I so apologize. I think it's, uh, you know, technical issues or whatever. I, I was there. I was like waiting to you. And you're like, oh, technical difficulties. I, was like, Please, I hope I get in soon. <laughs> well, we're glad to see you here. Um, I'll just go ahead and take care of a few, um, like, introductions and such. Um, I'm Eileen Zollinger. And that is my colleague, Daniel Aberman. Um, obviously, we have Dr. Burke joining us from NeuroHealth, which is an online neurology clinic. Um, he's a headache specialist, and um, I guess we're just going to get some information from him. Um, one of the first questions I have for you is, what exactly is a headache specialist? Because still in our community, even though we talk about them all the time, um, we still have people saying, well, what is a headache specialist? So uh, could you kind of give us a little background on that? Absolutely. Um, a headache specialist is usually, although not exclusively, a neurologist. And it's somebody who has done additional training, additional medical training in the subspecialty of headaches. So the way that I became a headache specialist is after medical school, I went to uh, a neurology residency. And you learn a lot in neurology residency about headache disorders and headache issues, but you don't know necessarily everything. You haven't seen very rare headache disorders. You haven't seen people who, you know, maybe have tried and not done very well with multiple other kinds of, of medications. And you're also usually in residency not that familiar uh, with all of the different procedures that a headache specialist can do. So in addition to residency, I did a fellowship in uh, headache disorders. So I, uh, my uh, residency was at NYU. My fellowship was at the Jefferson Headache Center. And uh, over there, they have an inpatient unit, which is not something that we see in a lot of places, and, uh, you know, a lot of clinical trials. And uh, there, there are, you know, uh, very, you know, heavy procedure days where you're doing a lot of different procedures. Uh, you can become a headache specialist also through uh, a physical medicine and rehabilitation uh, residency or actually through psychiatry. So those are the ways of doing it. There's actually a board certification also. So it's only given every couple of years. I happen to be on the board right now, so we were just discussing the next questions that are, uh, we're, we're gonna be testing the up, uh, up and coming uh, headache specialists on. And if you are lucky enough to go through all the training and pass uh, your board certification, then you are a fellowship trained board certified headache specialist. Wow, that sounds like a lot. I, I see a headache specialist as well, and I know that Danielle has been to mm -hmm. Jefferson um, in the mm -hmm. past, so uh, we're very, very familiar with, with all of that. Um, can you explain maybe a little bit more about who should see a headache specialist? Because I know, you know some people follow us who might only have a migraine attack a couple of times a year, and that may or may not warrant a headache specialist, so maybe you could um, kind of expand on that. Absolutely. I usually uh, recommend a headache specialist if you've tried uh, maybe just, you know, a few treatments that really haven't uh, had a lot of success, or if there's something strange or different, something missing about your, your situation or your story. Many people start out seeing a headache specialist, and if you're in a place where you can see somebody right away, that's ideal, but sometimes access is a problem. Uh, certainly anybody who um, hasn't had success for a while really should see a headache specialist. Okay, and I know we talk about that a lot in our community, just to try and get people to the right place um, where they're seeing the right person. So I appreciate that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how telehealth can help people with migraine and headache? Absolutely. We were just talking about access, and one of the main issues uh, that we have is, you know, you're asking what is a headache specialist? Another, you know, question is how many headache specialists exist? And the answer is somewhere south of, of 800. So it's 700 and some, uh, you know, board certified headache specialists. And uh, the problem is there are 
well over 40 million people in the United States just with migraine, and that's a common, uh, you know, but disabling headache disorder. Um, that's not everyone who even needs to see a headache specialist. Um, there is no possible way that everyone who even needs to see a headache specialist really can. The idea behind tele, uh, telehealth, it's, it's, it's a number of things, but one thing is access. Uh, it's so important for people who really wouldn't otherwise be able to see somebody to be able to actually see someone with expertise. Um, and, uh, you know, another major thing, uh, you know, is, is ease uh, and convenience. So, um, you know, if you think about, you know, uh, what going to see your doctor is going to look like 10, 15 years down, you know, the, the road from now, I don't think that it's going to be that you get into your car, let's say New York City's behind me, right? So, uh, you know, you, you spend an hour and a half driving to the city, you spend $60 on parking, you wait for an hour and a half at your doctor's office for a 20 minute appointment, and then, you know, spend another hour and a half driving back. You've spent your entire day seeing a doctor. The advantage to, to telehealth certainly is that you can be sitting at your, you know, in your, at your dining room table, you can be wherever is most convenient for you. People sometimes can even do it at work in your, you know, cubicle or, or, you know, in, in a, you know, a private area. In 20 minutes, you're done. You want, you had your follow-up appointment, everything is done. Specifically with regards to headache, the fact that so many patients are not, uh, you know, necessarily, um, you know, dealing with, uh, the kinds of neurological disorders where you need as much to do a hands-on physical exam, and there is so much that is actually standardized right now uh, with a virtual exam, uh, makes it so that way it is a very safe option. And if there are questions or issues, there are either you know neurologists that we can send you to to be seen in person, or we can refer you for imaging, so that way we can actually definitively determine if there is something that's questionable going on. That's one of the things that we have, I think, been so excited about having Nura on board um, is the fact that that access is available now to pretty much everybody, um, at least in the United States, right? Okay. Absolutely. Um, and uh, right now we are available to even prescribe medications and order tests in the vast majority of places where people live. Um, and you can see our website for all the different states, and it's always changing. We're always getting more licenses, and sometimes state by state, you know, the, the laws of what you're able to, to do and prescribe can change. Even the states that we can't prescribe, what we, you know, technically call it as an educational appointment, where we can still review everything with you, give us our opinions as to what we think is, is happening, and uh, work with your local doctors to get you the things that you need, whether that's you know, an MRI, what kind of MRI is it that your doctor has to order? Um, if there are either preventer of acute medications, some things that your doctor may be ordering differently, or, you know, a lot of the subtleties can really make a difference. So having somebody even where we can't necessarily directly prescribe, even in those, you know, states where we can't yet, and hopefully we will very soon, uh, makes a huge difference. It really does. And like I said, that's part of why we've been so so excited about the service being available now, because we do, on a regular basis, talk to people who are saying, you know, I, I scheduled with a headache specialist, but it's nine months out. You know, what do I do then? And we always tell them, well, go to Neuro because you'll see somebody very quickly and you'll get your treatment started that much quicker. So we're, if we're very just, excited. If I can just add, you mm -hmm. have people that they've had um, an attack going on for five days and they can't get in to see their doctor for several weeks and they just tell them to go to the ER. Yeah. So it's just not acceptable. No, I couldn't agree more. And there are many options that are available, you know, aside from necessarily going to the ER. Obviously, you know, one concern that you might have is, is something terrible happening. And certainly virtually and through a virtual exam, we can help to determine if that's you know, if it's necessary to go to an ER specifically for an evaluation of, uh, you know, a new onset neurological issue, or sometimes the question is, this is a little different than my aura, should I be concerned or not? Sometimes we say yes, and sometimes we can reassure you and say, no, don't worry about that. That is definitely something that we see uh, as a very common kind of aura. Now, you guys are focused in the United States right now, right? We're not, you can you see people in other countries or 
So uh, we technically can, the same way we can give an educational appointment, the issue is uh, that you will still have to have uh, a United States uh, phone number. Uh, that's the only thing that we, that we still do require. Um, if there, if you have access to that and you're, you know, even, uh, you know, the truth is a Canadian phone number still works uh, with the United States because it's the same, you know, country code, it's still the plus one. Uh, but we, we have seen people, you know, out of, uh, out of the country, uh, even just for an evaluation, even for a second or a third opinion. Uh, and, the, you know, they, they have issues sometimes seeing uh, a specialist where they are. Okay, that's good information. That was a couple of people, I, I saw the questions scrolling up there, so I wanted to make sure we threw that in there uh, before we moved on. Um, so we did have some questions come in from the community, um, and we wanna make sure that um, we try and answer those as best we can. Our other colleague, Jen, Jennifer Bregnan, will be um, in the comments and dropping links. So if you guys um, need anything there, she'll, she'll answer. Um, so Danielle, do you have, do you want to start us off with the questions? Sure, I would love to. And I just want to remind everybody that um, Dr. Burke is a fantastic headache specialist, but he is not your headache specialist. So everything right. that is shared here is general information for educational purposes. So that's the, you know, that's the extent to which um, um, he will be answering today. So um, we have a lot of questions. We'll get to as many as, that we, as we can. The first one is, can migraine be considered a disability if it causes too much uh, work to, uh, to be missed? Oh. oh, I think we lost your... There you go. Yes, here, here you are. Okay. My apologies. No. Uh, yes, the answer is migraine can definitely be considered a disability uh, for, uh, you know, for, for many people. Um, obviously, what we uh, aim to do is to take better control of migraine before it becomes so disabling. But <clears throat> when it comes to work, when it comes to workplace accommodations and, or, or, or school, Absolutely, uh, I think it's very important to have specific accommodations for you, especially if migraine is something that is more frequent. Uh, if the accommodations are things like you need uh, a quiet place uh, to, to rest, uh, you know, every so often. Uh, if if it's that uh, you know you need uh, maybe sometimes a, a break on screens if you're in the throes of exacerbation, any of those things uh, can definitely be a true workplace accommodation and. Uh, sometimes people even have to go on, you know, long-term disability if uh, they're really significantly disabled by migraine. Yeah, and we've heard that a lot within our community as well, as far as having to go on disability. And I think um, generally people say that they have a better chance of attaining disability, if that's the right way to phrase it, if they use um, some sort of legal representation. So. That's obviously not our conversation today, but um, just something for, for everyone to think about. Um, can you give us a little bit of information or talk a little bit about allodynia and how we experience that with migraine? Absolutely. There are a number of different kinds of abnormal sensations that sometimes people can get with migraine. Um, sometimes as part of an aura, you might experience what we call paresthesia, which is usually a positive phenomenon. It's a sensation on top of what you would normally feel. Uh, so that's usually a kind of numbness and tingling. The word numbness we use in English can either refer to that kind of numbness and tingling, you know, that kind of pins and needles sensation, or it can mean the lack of feeling. So sometimes it's really important to distinguish between those two things. And they can definitely imply very different things. Um, there's, you know, dysesthesia, which, you know, usually means a painful sensation when there isn't any. So instead of it being pins and needles, you can sometimes have like pain in a limb that can even be associated with migraine. Allodynia is a little different. Allodynia is uh, what we think about when a normal stimulus is perceived as painful. And that does often happen when people have such frequent migraine attacks that they're developing chronic migraine and there's something that we call uh, central sensitization, which basically means that you, those areas of the brain are so overloaded with pain signaling that even when it's a normal stimulus, somebody is just touching or, you know, your head is on your head, there's something that is 
very benign and normal kind of stimulus is perceived by the brain because it's getting uh, all of this feedback that's saying pain, pain, pain uh, as a pain signal also. So it's like the pain receptors are sort of turned on like all the time, you can't turn them off? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, can people get migraine attacks with chest pressure or chest pain? If you're developing chest pain or chest pressure, I definitely recommend that you discuss that not just with your neurologist, but I would even say more importantly with your internal medicine doctor or cardiologist because uh, we want to make sure, uh, and this is you know the truth with most other kinds of symptoms that you'd be experiencing with uh, you know with migraine. If it's something that isn't very classic with migraine, that it isn't something else. That it isn't something that more commonly presents due to another kind of condition or another issue. Um, is it you know common? Is it possible? It certainly wouldn't be something that is common. Uh, could it happen maybe secondary to some of the medications that you take? We do know that tryptan medications very frequently are associated with a tryptan reaction, which is usually soreness or tightness even, um, usually the upper chest, the jaws, the shoulders. Um, and it could be that when you're taking your tryptan, if you're very sensitive to it, uh, and especially if it's one of the more potent tryptans like I would say sumatriptan, which is Imitrex, you know, Zomig, Zomitriptan, or Relpax, uh, which is Elotriptan. Those ones tend to do it a little bit more. Uh, some people are going to be sensitive to all of the different tryptans, but I would definitely discuss that with your doctor. Um, I would definitely say that um, it isn't out of the realm of possibility, but it really has to be something that everyone has, you know, fully evaluated uh, and, uh, you know, actually determine that there truly is no other uh, condition. You know, it, it isn't, uh, you know, a cardiopulmonary issue. That's, that's really positive. Okay, that's good, good information. Um, can you talk a little bit about retraining our brains and neuroplasticity, sort of like um, learning to recognize pain-free moments when you're having head pain 24 seven? Absolutely. Um, it is, I think it goes without saying that so much of the focus that we have many times really is on which medications will be best, you know, what medicine, you know, equals what, you know, best treatment. And the truth is, usually what you want to do is take sometimes a more holistic approach to, to kind of borrow a term that's been maybe, you know, overused or misused a lot of times. You definitely have to think not just in terms of you know, which, you know, medicine, you know, which medical treatment, but sometimes what other things can also help you. Um, there are a number of ways that certain non-medical treatments can make a very big difference. And that can be things like biofeedback. Um, it can even just be making observations and tracking your headache symptoms and learning a lot about it. Sometimes just educating yourself about what happens in your brain during migraine, sometimes even visualizing that, all of those things can be helpful in different ways. Um, one of the things that we offer uh, in NeuroHealth as part of like the membership is coaching. And uh, coaching is something that uh, is relatively new to headache. Um, not to say that there aren't, you know, other, you know, places where you, you know, or, or people that, that, you know, can sometimes be, you know, kind of health coaches or, you know, kind of non-specific coaches that also can help with headache. But these are people that, you know, are very well educated with migraine specifically and make specific, um, you know, evidence-based recommendations. When we talk about, you know, doing some of these non-medical, you know, treatments, we definitely are also, um, you know, we're, we're, one of the things that we try to get to is, you know, tapping into what we call uh, the autonomic nervous system, um, the parasympathetics. These are ways of kind of almost overcoming the pain, you know, cycle that you have. Uh, neuroplasticity is something that I would say you would maybe more see when there's true damage to the brain and you're using other areas of the brain to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, help, you know, facilitate different, you know, motor activities, you know, sensory, you know, actions, things that, that, are necessary for other kinds of brain activity. I, I, I would say it's not impossible that 
uh, through some of these deep breathing exercises, through you know um, tapping into that parasympathetic response. There isn't some you know kind of plastic benefit to the brain. On the other hand, um, it isn't necessarily something direct. So it's a, it's a it's a global um, you know goal more so than you know something that. You know, we would talk about on an individual level, right now you are going to do X, Y, or Z for plasticity. It's more as, as part of everything that we're doing, you can have improvement that way. Okay. I love this next question because uh, I hear it all the time in social media. Is there a reason that migraine attacks would develop slowly in the afternoon almost every day? Yeah, there can be a number of reasons why. Um, I mean, the one thing that I would say is you definitely want, I mean, I think it's a great observation. You know, oftentimes people will say, I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing so many migraine attacks and you don't know when, you don't know how, and you don't know what it's associated with. There could be so many potential causes. Sometimes what we might say is actually, if it's related to your position and it's not so much uh, just migraine and it's slowly worsening throughout the day as long as you're upright and you know when you let's say lay back or, or you know maybe we would think that it's actually a completely different cause like a spinal fluid leak you know could it be that it's associated with some other trigger maybe some you know office mate that you have is wearing perfume that's triggering it maybe it's something that you are eating you know every single day at lunch you know, and, you know, or, or some other environmental trigger, right? Maybe it's the fluorescent lights that are in your office that finally get to you at that point. So there can be, you know, uh, a number of different reasons why that happens. And I definitely think that this would be a great thing to discuss, first of all, with your doctor, and even more so, I would say, with like a headache coach and talk about, you know, what kinds of lifestyle modifications or, you know, workplace accommodations you could request. Yeah, that's, that's really good information. Um, the next question is one I haven't really thought about. Um, is there a relationship between migraine and the circadian rhythm? There are closer relationships between other headaches and circadian rhythm. So for instance, one of the things that we know with cluster headache is usually when a person is in cycle, they will wake up you know, from a headache very shortly after they fall asleep, or it'll happen right after they wake up in the morning or right before the time that they're going to wake up. So it's very closely tied to, to circadian rhythm. There's another kind of headache called hypnic headache where people wake up literally the exact same time at night. That's very closely tied to circadian rhythm. What I would say about migraine is uh, your, your brain thrives on predictability. Sleep is one of the most important things that your brain needs to do in order to really thrive also. Um, it spends about a third of its life in this sleep state. And the more predictable that you can be with regards to the time that you go to sleep, the time that you wake up, the better that you will be. And that's definitely uh, something that, 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 that we see as a trigger. If you're, you're maybe you know sleeping too much or too little, that both, either of those can be triggers for migraine. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a direct uh, correlation uh, but sleep and migraine are very, very closely intertwined. Yeah, my headache specialist always talks about how the migraine brain really likes to have a routine. And when you get too far outside of that, whether it's sleeping too much or sleeping too little, um, that it can sort of trigger some issues. That's very true. Even, you know, daylight savings time is something that can yeah. throw people off. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a very engaged vestibular migraine community and I knew this question would come up and they, somebody wants to know is there a best medication for vestibular migraine it you know just like migraine itself you really have to take a very individualized approach and um, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's one best medication for everybody um, there are a number of different approaches in general that people can take for vestibular migraine sometimes uh, your specialist may want to look at it and, and try to treat it um, as any other kind of run-of-the-mill migraine and give specific, you know, give, give migraine-specific treatments as opposed to things that can really help vestibular migraine. Uh, your headache specialist might say, you know what, there's maybe some additional benefit with the use of either lamotrigine or calcium channel blockers, and they might try that instead as, as a first-line medicine. Um, 
the the real answer is the thing that works best for you is what's really best for you. So I wouldn't necessarily say that there's one best medication or one best treatment. Okay, that's good. Um, the other question, sort of, again, in line with medication, is if one medication seems to be working well, is there a reason to switch to another? I mean, assuming that we're not having a ton of side effects or, you know, something from the initial medication, is there a reason to sort of jump ship? I think that there are two main reasons to jump ship. Obviously, like you said before, tolerance and side effects. Um, and ineffectiveness is definitely a reason. The question is, how long do you want to give a medication? And the truth is, your doctor really should have a good idea as to when specific kinds of medications will start to kick in. So certain medications will you know, be effective sometimes within a few days, sometimes within a few weeks, sometimes within a few months. When it comes to something like Botox, it'll usually be two or three, sometimes even more cycles of Botox before you really want to give up on it. Yep. Exactly. So sometimes yep. it can take time. So depending on what your treatment is, uh, you do want to give it, you know, if you're tolerating it very well, um, you know, a, a good chance, uh, you know, a good opportunity to work at a certain point. Um, if you've exhausted the you know appropriate dose and you've been on it for long enough and you're still not that much better there's no reason to continue being on it that brings up uh, the next question which what what is a, a good time a good amount of time to give a medication a chance i think every different kind of medication is different so you know depending on the medicine um it like i was saying before with something like botox it would probably mean you know if you can tolerate it if you're not having any tolerance issues with it i would definitely say three full cycles before totally giving up on it and if there's some iffiness and maybe one of the cycles was actually pretty decent maybe the third one wasn't that great i would maybe recommend continuing on it but you know giving uh gi giving you another medication or another kind of treatment to you know help boost the effectiveness of the botox and there are uh, there's actually, you know, more and more evidence for the use of, as long as your insurance can actually cover it, some of the CGRP medications, either the injectables or even the orals, plus Botox, that would be something to consider. When it comes to the CGRP medications, I would say at a minimum three months, you know, uh, again, with tolerance in mind, right. as long as you're tolerating the medication, if you're not tolerating it, it's not worth taking, you know, if you're having side effects to it. Um, oral medications, I would say for most of them, somewhere between four and six weeks. But again, keeping tolerance in mind. Some, you know, uh, are, are definitely uh, associated with a faster benefit than others. I would say most headache specialists would feel that um, something like amitriptyline, which often people start off with, is a medicine that most people feel some benefit with usually within the first week or two, like pretty soon after you start to take it. If it's been three or four weeks, does it really make sense to, to continue on it? You know, maybe we've even increased the dose at that point. If you're still not doing that much better and you're on a higher dose, it might make sense to move on to something else then. I know um, I had really good luck with um, CGRP combined with uh, Botox. Very true. But that can be sort of an issue for some people with their insurance uh, companies. I think the insurance companies are getting a little bit better about going ahead and approving both of those. Uh, but that definitely was an issue for many of us in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So more than anything, they just don't want to have to pay for too expensive treatments. Right. And there is a growing body of evidence that really shows that they're very synergistic. You know, it's like two plus two equals five. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. This one is, is kind of complicated. Um, how do headache specialists differentiate between migraine with aura, where weakness is present, migraine with unilateral motor symptoms and hemiplegic migraine. This is such a fantastic and uh, very nuanced question. Um, the one thing that I would say is most neurology residents and even I would say the majority of even really great general neurologists would have a very, very difficult time you know, telling all of these things apart Oftentimes, to be very honest, um, headache specialists can sometimes think that it's one thing 
and potentially get it wrong um, and you know decide afterwards that it's something else. So, you know, to kind of define the terms, what, what are these three different things? I'm sorry, so my dog about... is making so much noise back there. I'm sorry if y'all can hear <laughs> oh, that. Okay. I apologize. I don't, I don't hear it at all. It was making me laugh too, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Absolutely. When we think about um, all of these things, um, I think that it really comes down to, uh, and this is uh, what I was trying to allude to a little bit before, what is your aura symptom? Is it, um, you know, a, a kind of a numbness and tingling in the, in the arm? Uh, that would be something that we certainly would not call hemiplegic migraine. We wouldn't even necessarily call that, um, you know, migraine with motor symptoms or unilateral motor symptoms or mums, which is what uh, one of my uh, mentors, Dr. Bill Young, uh, he was the person who coined that term. Um, and um, what we would say, first of all, is, you know, what, what are those motor symptoms? For some people, it's a sensation of heaviness. Well, in that situation, that might just be a regular run-of-the-mill migraine with aura. Um, if it's just heaviness and you're still able to do everything, you're not dropping things, there's no true weakness during the attack. Another thing is also duration. Uh, if somebody truly has hemiplegic migraine, not only are they going to not be able to use that limb at all, uh, that's, it, it would really look like a stroke, which is by definition, you know, what we would call hemiplegic migraine, it would be, um, you know, something that would usually last longer than the typical hour, which is what we would say the longest aura should last anytime you're experiencing aura symptoms longer than 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, we do typically recommend seeking, you know, uh, a, you know some kind of uh, urgent medical evaluation because we want to make sure that it truly is just aura, number one. And number two, uh, that an aura isn't itself turning into something like stroke. Um, usually when we talk about hemiplegic migraine, usually we're talking about what we would call familial hemiplegic migraine, which is something that is runs very strongly in families. So if somebody really has a familial hemiplegic migraine, about half of their family on one side usually will have that, uh, that gene. It is autosomal dominant, so it's like a 50% um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, presence in, in that family. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's uh, usually something that the first time that it presents, the person is showing up to the emergency room and oftentimes they're confusing all the doctors who, who do think that it's an acute stroke and might even give them one of those big clot busting medicines to, uh, uh, to, to, to potentially break up a clot because, you know, the risk, uh, you know, of, of having a stroke would outweigh uh, you know, not necessarily doing that, uh, that procedure, that TPA, that clot busting, you know, medication. Um, migraine with unilateral motor symptoms is where you would see other kinds of motor issues. So it's not so much just a sensation of heaviness, but there really is something there, but it's not true hemiplegia. So that'll be something kind of in between where it's not motor at all, and it's really primarily sensory, and it's not hemiplegic. So that's how I would define all of these three things. Like I was saying, you know, like I said before, sometimes even, you know, some of the, the, the best of the best headache specialists can be fooled. So are they treated similarly as far as like a treatment plan goes with similar medications or, I mean, I know it's very individual to each, each patient, but just curiously. I, yeah, I would say that they imply very different things, especially somebody who has hemiplegic migraine. There is at least an implication that um, there's something more profoundly vascular that's happening. And uh, most headache specialists would not recommend a vasoconstrictive medicine like triptans or DHE for that person, certainly not during an attack, um, as opposed to your standard run of the mill migraine with aura, even if that aura is that weird sensation of heaviness, but you are still able to basically do everything and move that limb perfectly fine we would have no problem whatsoever recommending, uh, you know, a trip 10 in that situation. One thing that was published with mums is um, people with mums tend, and this is, you know, from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Young's own, uh, uh, you know, research, they, they tend to do a little bit better with injectable type medications for whatever reason. I don't think that it's completely known. So um, if you do have that kind of in-between where we think that it's this diagnosis of, of migraine, if you lateral motor symptoms, we may recommend 
um, you know, maybe an injectable, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory, an injectable Reglan, um, depending on the situation and what your symptoms are, maybe even an injectable tryptan. Thank you. That was a really good, yeah. comprehensive it answer. Was. Really appreciate it. I do want to be aware of your time. Do, do you have time for another couple of Absolutely. questions? Absolutely. Okay. All right. We'll try to make them quick. Um, what are some options for intense nausea when preventive medications aren't getting the job done? Um, when we say when preventive medications aren't getting the job done, we always want to think about preventive medications as, you know, things that can try to help stave off the exacerbations. But when an exacerbation happens, I wouldn't necessarily recommend taking more of the preventive medication. Exacerbation is going to be associated usually, especially if we're talking about migraine, with pain and other symptoms like nausea, light and sound sensitivity also. Um, we do typically recommend some anti-nausea type medication if this is really profound. Uh, and uh, often, if not almost always, you can take that together with your you know, standard preventive medications. Let's say you've taken a preventive that day and even some of the other acute medicines that you take. So that uh, anti-nausea medicine could be in the Reglan family. So we think about those as uh, like Reglan, Compazine, Promethazine, which is Phenergan. That's like one family of anti-nausea medicines. Another family is the Zofran family of medicines. So Zofran is like the most commonly used one, but there are, you know, there's like one other one that's very hard to find that's called Tigan. There are even some like off the beaten path uh, type anti-nausea medications, one is called Emend, you know, even so that there, there are, uh, you know, other options also that we use uh, sometimes it's even stronger, almost like antipsychotic type medication. Some, you know, uh, of the traditional, typical uh, type antipsychotic medications that can really actually help nausea significantly, like Haldol, which is haloperidol, mm -hmm. or yep. uh, Thorazine, which is chlorpromazine. So, like th sometimes those, even sometimes atypical uh, antipsychotic type medications that we'll even give for a short period of time, like Seroquel, uh, which is cutiapine. Uh, or olanzapine, which is Zyprexa. Okay. I know um, you wrote us a great article on nausea yes, and I migraines. Did. Yeah, so, yeah, um, I remember that. That would be, that would be something for um, those who are, who are watching to, to check out. Um, it was really informative. Um, the next question is about vasodilation as a trigger, and they're wondering if it can be managed. Um, they really struggle to go out in hot weather, strenuously exercise, or drink any alcohol. Um, they say it's very depressing and impacts their whole family. I, you know, I, I, I can completely and totally imagine, and you know, we do see this very frequently. I would say that even though in all of those situations there is some degree of vasodilation, what we actually have moved on uh, from understanding uh, that migraine is primarily due to vasodilation, and rather we think that migraine is more of an inflammatory type condition, that there are these inflammatory neurotransmitters that your body produces in response to certain triggers, and those same things will cause vasodilation. CGRP, if you wanted to take that as an example, it's not by far the only one of these inflammatory neurotransmitters, but it is a potent inflammatory one, and it is a potent vasodilatory uh, protein also. It causes both pain and vasodilation. The truth is, if you only had pain and not the vasodilation, likely you would still have migraine. Um, and, and there are debates about, you know, uh, you know, some of the nuances in migraine pathophysiology, but that's one thing that I would say most of us totally understand. And it very well could be that each one of those triggers, even though they all do have to an extent vasodilation as, as somewhat of a part of it, can actually trigger you in various different ways. One thing I'll definitely say about alcohol is there are some people that have specific you know, types of alcoholic drinks that are triggering for them. And if they avoid those things, maybe it's red wines, especially things that have a lot of tannins or sulfites. Um, maybe it's uh, things that, uh, you know, aren't, you know, kind of the clear spirits. Some people do, do well specifically with clear spirits. Some people are triggered by all kinds of alcohol. And um, when, when it comes to those other things like uh, being around hot weather or exercise, 
um, sometimes trying to mitigate those specific you know, things. So trying to make sure that you are cool, especially if you're going to, to try to exercise. If it's that combination that, that uh, you know, could be, uh, you know, try, try to do it indoors. Make sure that you hydrate a ton beforehand. To be very honest also, if you're noticing a lot of different triggers, and most people don't always have a one trigger that always, always causes their headache, um, you might want to think about really, you know, better preventive options for your headache to make it so that way you may still at times be triggered by these things, but you're much less sensitive to it on a daily basis. That's great. Do you, um, can you just add, answer one more question that came in? Sure. What are your thoughts on magnesium? I think that magnesium is something that can definitely be helpful preventing, especially lower frequency migraine attacks. Um, it's something that um, when you're, let's say, you know, in, uh, if you're experiencing a lot of migraine, if you're doing multiple different things for migraine, sometimes magnesium is almost like a, you know, a, a drop in the ocean and it really isn't enough. But for somebody, especially who's experiencing, let's say somewhat less than the standard, like four headache attacks a month, you know, or on average one a week, where we would really want to recommend a, a better preventive formal medication, it can definitely be something that's helpful. I wouldn't say that it's a panacea. I wouldn't say that it's a cure. I would say that it's definitely something as an oral medication or as an oral supplement that can be you know, helpful preventively. And um, it, it may be not enough for many people. Um, and if you're somebody who experiences migraine just a couple of times a year, probably wouldn't even help you that much. The other time that we would definitely want to use it is in what we call status migraineosis. If you're experiencing migraine for 72 plus hours mm -hmm. um, and you're getting what some people like to term a migraine cocktail or various medications to really help migraine, one of the things you'll be surprised that they'll actually give you in an emergency room or an infusion suite would be actually magnesium because that kind of magnesium can also be helpful in addition to everything else that people are giving you. I had that at Jefferson as part of my yes. migraine cocktail also. Yes, absolutely. Did. Well, I know that you're- There's you're just one more question. Yeah. I'm so sorry. There's one question more and then I swear we're going to let you go. But uh, this was another one that came through and we have so many people who ask this question and it's what are the most effective treatment options for menstrual migraine? We have so many people struggle with this and, you know, perimenopause and menopause. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's rough. I, uh, you know, just like some of the other, you know, what are the best, Yeah. Uh, you know, there may not necessarily be a best, but um, there are options that, that a lot of people recommend depending on the kind of migraine that you have. Let's say it's migraine without aura where we're not necessarily worried about using like extra estrogen, sometimes being on a very low dose estrogen uh, birth control sometimes can be helpful. And that might be something that your uh, neurologist or headache specialist would talk to your OBGYN about what potential options could be helpful. And uh, sometimes having that lower drop in estrogen than your body would normally have actually can be helpful. Um, sometimes using a longer acting triptan like rovitriptan narrow triptan that's something that some people will use just around uh, the time that you're on your period uh, mm -hmm. or sometimes starting the day before similarly uh, an anti-inflammatory that's also longer acting like naproxen which is a leave or prescription uh, uh, strength which would be nebumatone similar kind of longer acting anti-inflammatory medication both of those theoretically could be helpful for menstrual migraine uh, as of right now, the g pants, right, so Ubrelvi Nurtec type medications haven't been studied for menstrual migraine, but we okay. definitely want to get some additional information on them. And very likely there can be some benefit there too. Perfect. Well, we really, really appreciate your time and coming on Thank and you. answering all of these questions for us. Um, we'd love to do it again sometime because there's even more questions coming in all the time. So, for sure. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And you have a great day. Thank you. you too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good job. Good. good.